Matthew chapter 28. As you're turning there, we've been doing this 35 years uh, as Hickory Grove and at least 20 here at North where the pastor and congregation will celebrate the resurrection. We do it like this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. We thank the Lord for that. Thank God for the resurrection of Jesus. That's what we'll preach about today. Matthew 28, you'll find a passage that is familiar to you. If you've been here for the last few Sundays, last Sunday we talked about the crucifixion. We did that right before the crucifixion where Jesus stood before Pilate. And then Friday, how many of you were able to be there at the Good Friday service? Raise your hand if you were there. Oh, wasn't that really a remarkable service that Friday? It was just a great service Friday. Uh, we talked about the crucifixion. And this morning then, we turn our attention to the resurrection. If you're a guest here with us today, this is what we do every Sunday. This Easter Sunday is not any different than what we do on a typical Sunday is we sing together, sing to the Lord, then we open up God's Word, we read it, and then we spend the next few moments just hearing what does God's Word say to us. And very specifically this morning, we look at the veracity, the truthfulness, the picture of why we actually have church on Sundays. It's right here in chapter 28. Why don't we read verse 1 down to about verse 10. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin in verse 1. <clears throat> now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came out and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. They came up, and they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit, I pray that you would encourage those that have heavy hearts. Your believing children many of which are just suffering and need a word of hope. So I pray you would do that today. For all the men and women that are here today that are wondering what this actually means, what it means to be a Christian, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you might give them ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to believe. The one we preach today, his name is Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is the Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. This is the Sunday that all other Sundays are patterned after. Whatever joy you might have as a believer, whatever grace you might experience as one forgiven, whatever hope you might have as a child of God, wherever you might find Christianity, you find it grounded in the resurrection. Part of what we believe is Jesus did a whole lot of really great things. When Jesus walked on this earth, he did a whole lot of really great things. He healed the sick, raised the dead. He fed the poor. He gave sight to the blind. He was a great teacher. He was a wise communicator. He was a forceful preacher. 
But Christianity does not reside in those good things. Christianity doesn't reside in the good things Jesus taught or the kind things Jesus did. If the passage that I just read is not true, then we have no hope. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he looked back on the resurrection, he wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 15. And in the 14th verse of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And then in verse 17, that same chapter, Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. That's why we celebrate the resurrection. You see, the resurrection is the seal. The resurrection is the capstone of the work that Christ came to do. The resurrection of Jesus is the crowning proof that the debt for our sin has been paid. So let's get to the text in front of us, Matthew 28. In our story, in Matthew 28, there's an earthquake. Now, if you were there Friday night, you know that at the crucifixion of Jesus, Matthew 27, when Jesus died, lots of supernatural things happened. Earth went dark. One of those things that happened was there was an earthquake at the death of Jesus. There's an earthquake at the resurrection of Jesus. Matthew Henry, a great Puritan expositor. In fact, you can find uh, commentaries, Matthew Henry commentaries, they're not easy to read, but if you'll muddle through some of the stuff now and then, you'll run up on something that's really good. Matthew Henry said that the earthquakes, when Jesus died, the earth that received him shook for fear. When Jesus arose, the earth now leapt for joy. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a really good thought. And, and really, isn't that what the resurrection tells us? Isn't that what the resurrection of Jesus is about? Great, unfettered joy. Now, for every one of you that named the name of Christ that are sitting here today, and you're a Christian, so I'm going to just talk to Christian people today. If you are already a Christian, what I'm hoping is that you can be reminded, regardless of what you're facing or going to face, that underneath all that you believe is this deep well of joy that Jesus gives you because of the resurrection. For all of you that are not believers today, it's my hope that, that you can turn from whatever it is you've been believing in and that you might walk away from here today with a confident and deep joy in Jesus Christ. For all of you that have lost someone this year, Church this size, we have lots of funerals and lots of family members that lose people they love. And this may be the first Easter that you've been in church without that person. What the resurrection does, if that person died in Christ, what the resurrection does is remind us of the great hope that is ours. A thousand years from now, and whatever health regime you're on, you're not going to last a thousand years. So, so a thousand, because if I said a hundred, some of you say, well, I'm going to live to be 130. Well, then a thousand years from now, the only real thing that will matter is you'll look back on the resurrection of Jesus that gives you joy. And so if you're not a Christian today, the question you've got to grapple with is right here in this passage. After the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus died on the cross in the place of sinners. After the crucifixion of Jesus, did Jesus Rise from the dead. You see, Christianity is not Christianity without two things. That's why the cross behind me, you see a cross, and written across it is the word risen, because these two things must be a part of Christianity. The cross of Jesus, Him dying in the place of sinners, and the resurrection. If you don't have the resurrection, you don't have Christianity. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, if He did, then His authority is absolute 
And His authority calls for you to trust Him and love Him. In fact, that's what I want to say today. I'll make that the theme today. That's what I want you to see. The resurrection means that you should love Jesus with your whole life. You're, you want the, what the application of the sermon is? The resurrection of Jesus. This is what it means. It means that every one of you, that, that I need to love Jesus with my whole life. Let's make it a short sermon. You want to? It's Easter Sunday. I'm in this cotton suit. It's not going to last very much longer. It's about 13 years old. I'm going to have to retire it soon. So I'll make it a short. I'll give you just two points today. Here's the first one. Number one. You should love him because of his grace. You should love him for his grace. Christianity is religion of grace. What we believe saves us is God's grace. There's not oppression in Christianity. There is freedom in Christianity because of grace. The one mark that should be ours in our religion is grace. The free gift of His love. A forgiveness that you can't earn. An affection that none of us deserve. It's grace. And it's all wrapped up in the new covenant that comes in Jesus Christ. It's right there, I think, in verse 1. Let me show it to you, verse 1. It's packaged up in verse 1. This is why we go to church on Sundays, and we don't go to church on Saturdays. You find it right there in verse 1. Look when the resurrection happened. Let me read it to you, verse 1. <clears throat> now, I would circle that phrase, now, after the Sabbath. Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there's an earthquake. When did it happen? On the first day of the week. After the Sabbath, toward the dawning of the first day of the week. You know what you got right there in that little phrase? That is a brief description of a monumental shift that the resurrection brings. Why? Well, remember back, if you know the Bible's story, and by the way, when you're preaching a passage, you have to take it in its context, in Matthew. Matthew is in the New Testament. The New Testament is part of the Bible. There's one story, one redemptive story you find in the Bible. In Genesis, we have the account of God creating the heavens and the earth. God took six days, in Genesis 2, six days to create the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, He rested. So that Sabbath became a remembrance of God creating in six days, seven day rest. The last day of the week, Saturday, rest. When God decided to pull his people up out of Egypt, use Moses to bring them out and go into the promised land. And there he made this covenant people and he had the covenant of the law. Remember that Exodus chapter 20. One of the ways that the people, God's people, would be marked off from every other person out there in the promised land would be the way they looked at the calendar. Six days they work, seventh day rest. Sabbath. In fact, they made it one of the commandments, fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day? Keep it holy. Well, Matthew tells us in chapter 27, when Jesus breathed His last on the cross... When Jesus said, it is finished, when that happened, you remember what Matthew told us about? When that happened in the temple, there's a veil that dropped down and separated the Holy of Holies from everybody else, saying that you can't get to God. God is too holy for you to come near. When Jesus breathed his last and said, it is finished from top to bottom, it's God initiated from top to bottom, the veil tore open that said, you may now in Christ come in. Telling us that the old covenant has been kept, the law has been kept, the real sacrifice has been made, redemption has been secured, and here in the text, after the crucifixion, okay, think like this. Friday, Jesus is killed, crucified. It is finished. Saturday, the Sabbath, Jesus, lies still, keeping the Sabbath. In fact, press on it, keeping the very last Sabbath 
for God's people. When that happens, the old covenant of law has been kept completely by Jesus in a way that you and I could never keep it. Now, God the Father, what He's doing is He is establishing a new covenant in Jesus the Son. You think, what, what is this preacher talking about? Well, keep, stay with me now. Think of it like this. What Jesus has done, this is why it's so important, the God-man. Jesus, fully God, fully man. Jesus, fully man, lived a perfect life. It's why we stress that, because He fulfilled all righteousness. And there at His death, what the Puritans called the great exchange, on the cross, Jesus took the penalty for sin. God is a just God, must penalize sin. He, he took all of the penalty for all of the sins that are committed, for all of those that will be saved. Dying on the cross for them, right? And then God raised him from the dead. But before he raised him from the dead, the great exchange is he took our punishment. We get his righteousness. So his stillness on Saturday, that's why Saturday is so important. Friday he died, Sunday he's raised, Saturday he kept the Sabbath. Now His resurrection on Sunday, the Lord's Day, what He has done now, He has given us something no religion can ever earn. And every religion is trying to earn something. You can put two columns. Think of it like this. Put two columns up, draw a line between them. I would put religion on one side and resurrection on the other side. Religion on one side, resurrection on the other side. Religion is oppressive. Resurrection is freeing. If you're religious, religion means death. Resurrection means life. If you have religion, it means work. You've got to do something to earn this God's favor. Religion is work. Resurrection is love. Religion is rules. You keep these rules if you want God to love you. Resurrection is relationship through Jesus to experience God's love. Religion is drudgery. It's hard to be religious. Resurrection is freedom. Religion is guilt. You'll never live up to what people are demanding of you. Resurrection is forgiveness. Religion is the law of God. Resurrection is the grace of God. It is God's grace in Christ that sets us free. Isn't that what Jesus said? John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son sets you free, you are what? Free indeed. Resurrection, it breaks the shackles. Resurrection breaks the shackles of a religion that tries to earn God's love, and it gives you freedom. In fact, I, I preached on this a few months ago or years ago. I don't know, you get older and time runs together. I don't even remember what I preached when, but sometime back we did the five solas. You remember that? The five onlys that really describe our Christianity. We believe that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the Bible alone, to the glory of God alone. You see the resurrection, what it does? The resurrection declares that you can love and trust Jesus. And so I want to give it to you like an application. If you believe the resurrection, you should love him for his grace. His grace. That's the first point. Let me give you a second point to consider. Here's number two. Not only should you love him for his grace, you should love him for his compassion. Compassion. Aren't you thankful that God has been compassionate to us in Christ? That He sees who we are and yet loves us still? I mean, the way that Matthew tells the story, and remember, we're, we're getting this out of the book of Matthew. The way that Matthew tells the story is remarkable. In fact, it's, do you see the characters? Who, who is there? The way Matthew tells it, you have two women, an angel, and Jesus. In verse 1, there are those two women. You see them. Go ahead and look at verse 1. You see it? Mary Magdalene. We know her name. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. How would you like to be known as the other Mary? 
There's Mary Magdalene, and there's, a, I don't know, another woman named Mary over there. There's Pete and repeat. Mary Magdalene. <laughs> the other Mary. I mean, Matthew he couldn't even find out her last name. We find out from the other gospel writers who know who she is, but Matthew says it like this. It's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And they are the picture of faithfulness. Think about these two women now. I just need to think about it. It's, it's remarkable the way Matthew has written it. These two women, they ministered to Jesus in Galilee. If you follow in chapter 27 over in verse 56, Matthew tells us that these two women were there at Golgotha. They stood there. Now don't forget all of their other disciples. One has killed himself. The other 11 have all the men are gone. These two women stayed there through the entire thing. Verse 56, they were there when Jesus breathed his last. Chapter 27, verse 61, Matthew tells us that after Jesus died on the cross, he got to do something with the body. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, these two guys that were believers in hiding, they came out. They got Jesus' body, laid it in a new tomb. That was on Friday. Saturday's the Sabbath. You can't do anything. And the text is telling us these two women, early on, the first chance they could do it. They, they, they didn't come looking for a resurrected Jesus. They came to do the gruesome work of preparing his body for burial. Two women. Verse 2, that's where business picks up. Let me read verses 2, 3, and 4. You follow along in the Bible with me. Verse 2. And behold... Now let me pause there and say, from verse 1 down to verse 11, Matthew four times uses the word behold. It is his way of saying, I need your attention right here. You're not going to believe what I'm getting ready to tell you. Behold, there's a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. So here's the earthquake again. An angel came and notice what the angel did in verse 2. Rolled back the stone and sat on it. Why is everybody sitting down? The angel came, rolled the stone, sat down. Why? Because of the finished work of Jesus. There's not any more work to do for salvation. It's over. The angel sat down. Verse 3. Notice the description in verse 3. His appearance was like lightning. You ever been close when lightning struck something? It is terrifying. Be inside and at night and thunderstorm rolling through and lightning strike a tree outside. It's like it struck you. This angel was like lightning. Not only that, look at the description. Light lightning and his clothing as white as snow. So you get the picture, right? The angel of the Lord has descended from heaven. It's not, an, it's not an unusual thing. When it comes to Jesus, angels frequently attended Jesus. Matthew tells us in the birth of Jesus, when Jesus came, the incarnation, Virgin Mary gave Birth to Jesus. You remember the angels were there? How about when Jesus was a full-grown man and tempted by Satan before his earthly ministry? You remember that? After he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness and the Bible says that the angels came there and ministered to him. Luke tells us on the night he was betrayed there in the garden with his closest friends praying and his friends sleeping and as he sweat great drops of blood, the Bible says that after when he finally yielded drinking the cup, the Bible says that the angels came and ministered to him. Do you find it strange? We go to the cross and there he is on the cross. There's no mention of angels. But now Saturday has passed, the resurrection has come, and they are in radiance. Sitting on a stone is this angel. The angel has opened the tomb, not so that Jesus can get out. The angel has opened the tomb so that the women can see in. And notice what the angel says to the women. Let's go back to verses 4. I can only presume. Let me just give you 4, 5, and 6. Verse 4 the angel shows up, verse 4, And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. 
Here are Roman soldiers. They've seen lots of gruesome things in their career. They've been posted there by Pilate because the rumor is that the disciples are going to come back and try to steal the body. The guards are there. These really valiant Roman soldiers, the angel shows up. I like that they didn't just pass out. See verse 4, they trembled first. I like that they suffered a little bit before they went unconscious. <laughs> right, so they trembled first and it was so terrifying that they just fell out and passed out. We can only assume when you get to verse 5 that the two guards are just laying there, laid out, just passed out. You can only assume that they're still laid out. And notice the conversation that goes on in verse 5 and 6. Look what the angel says in verse 5. Do not, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I, I like that those two warriors were scared to death to the degree of passing out. And he says to the women, they've not passed out. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid, for I know that you, look, look what the angel has said. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place. You want proof? Come and see the place where he lay. Now let's pause right there. And let me just sort of draw out three or four things that I think are important about this passage. And especially in regards to celebrating the resurrection. Here's the first one that I'd like to point out. There in verse 5, you'll notice what the angel called Christ. Let me show it to you again. Notice what, what he says. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. You see that the angel identified Christ as the one who died. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is risen. Crucified, risen. Both of those are necessary for you and I to be close to God. We must have the Jesus that was crucified and the Jesus that was raised from the dead. There are lots of counterfeit Jesus out there. It's not enough to seek the Jesus who lived as a really good example. It's not enough to seek the Jesus who taught as a great wise man. We seek the Jesus who was crucified in the place of sinners and raised in real victory. Why do we seek that Jesus? It's because of what Paul said. Paul said that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the Jesus we seek. There's something else here I want you to see. Uh, it's, it's astonishing to me. Here's the second thing. It's astonishing to me, the resurrection story, it's not going to be believable as it is. It's astonishing to me, Jesus is first seen by women. It's the women that stayed at the cross. It's the women that went to deal with his dead body. I mean, look, look at it. Verse, let me just show it to you. Verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, ran to tell the disciples. It's the women. You, you think, preacher, why are you making a big deal out of this? Well, the way this is written, Matthew is writing this to give veracity to the resurrection. He's writing to an audience trying to convince them. If he had made up, if the early disciples had made up the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead, if they were creating this story, they would have made it so that men went to the tomb. It's not like it is now. Men and women back then were not thought of as equal. And a, a woman's testimony wouldn't prove to be true. 
The fact that God is using the women is showing us this is God's truth. Not only that, this speaks to the great equality between men and women in Christ. This speaks to a gospel humility that permeates everybody that follows Jesus. As you read on in verse 9, notice the women meet him. Let me take you to verse 9. Verse 9. <clears throat> and behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up, they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. They worshipped him. Here is our example. They immediately worship him. You understand that the most appropriate response to the crucified, resurrected Jesus, the most appropriate response to the one who died for sinners, who was raised into completion, that one requires your worship. You, you come here today. You come in your mind. Come here to the nail. Come here with the women to the nail scarred Join them, in, join them in the text. They've seen the resurrected Jesus. They've gone to the ground and it's, it's His feet. There's no room for pride at the nail-scarred feet. There's no room for excuses down there. Don't, don't bring your explanations. Don't, don't bring your bitterness. Unforgiveness. Only worship. You see, the scars are a sacrament. And that sacrament speaks to our salvation. I think it's worth mentioning one more thing here in the text that, that is, the, I think, the fullest picture of compassion. Notice what Jesus says to the women. Verse 10. I think this is a remarkable thing. Verse 10, you see it? Go tell my brothers. His brothers. One of them hung himself, Judas, the arch betrayer. Peter, just as bad, he's a verbal denier. The other ten at the cross, they, they just, com just completely abandoned him. You know what this, right here now, I want you to look at it. For those that are Christians and those that are not. This has specific meaning and application for every sinner. Every sinner. Jesus calls out to sinners, go and tell my brother. Regardless of what you've done in Christ, because of what He's done at the cross and the resurrection, you can be brought in as family. Now, I've pointed these things out to you as a way of comfort and encouragement. For those of you that are Christians, this ought to be reason for you to celebrate today. But if you are not a Christian, my intent today is just to bring you to the Bible. It's the Word of God. And just to show you grace, that you should love Jesus for His grace. You see, the cross says, my sins are paid for. The resurrection says, we are accepted in Christ. The resurrection says that you should love Jesus for His compassion. That's the Jesus we know. Jesus of the Bible is compassionate. The Bible says in, 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 in Psalms, the psalmist says that God knows that we are dust. And yet in His compassion and kindness, He has pursued you. He's brought you here today to forgive you, to love you, to accept you in Christ. In fact, let me, let me just close by explaining the gospel in four categories. God Man, Jesus Christ, our response. In this category, God is a holy creator, created all of us, created everything you see. He is holy, He is creator. In this category is man. Man is created 
in the image of God, but that image has been disfigured because of sin and now separated from God. Man is separated from God. God separated from man. God is holy. Man is a sinner. An eternal problem. That problem has one solution. That's the third category. That solution is Jesus who is fully God and fully man. Fully God in that He is divine. Fully man in that He carries and lives in a way that we cannot. The first Adam brought sin. The last Adam who is Jesus brings life and forgiveness. Jesus Christ lived perfectly. We can't. He did. And then died on the cross in the place of sinners, giving us His righteousness. So God is holy. Man is a sinner. Jesus has died in the place of sinners, making it so we can have access to God. There's a fourth category. And that category is our response. Faith. You turning from your sin and by faith believing what Jesus has done for you. This story is written for you to come to faith in Jesus. Will you join me as we pray together? Get your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord. Time of commitment and prayer. This is what we do on Sunday mornings. After hearing a sermon, we give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe for the first time in your life, you sort of put the pieces together and now you've seen God is holy, you are a sinner, and you need Jesus. We want to talk to you about what that means. The way we do that here is we'll all be standing and singing in a few moments. That is our invitation. That is Hickory Grove inviting you to come to Jesus. You'll see pastors down here at the front, other trained leaders that will just pray with you and talk to you about what it means to give your life to Christ. If God has spoken to your heart, we'll invite you to come forward as we sing. You join me as we pray together. Father, for the grace you've given us in Jesus, I pray that by your spirit you apply it to men and women today. I pray that you would encourage believers in ways that go beyond my ability. And I pray that you would call out those without Christ, bring them to faith in Jesus so that they might live lives that honor you. Thank you for the resurrection of Christ, for it's in the resurrection we celebrate today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?